works. So let me get the samples so we can try to get the process here. So let me just get one like they have on the exercise and cumulative review. So I want to just do the outlier part. So I'm going to have to take that sample to rearrange it and to see if there are any outliers or not. So let me get this board for this. So I need to do two things and copy the sample and to also arrange its elements from the smallest to the largest. So let's see, the smallest seem to be a negative 241. Right. 241 here. And then we'll, we'll get a negative 151 and then 125. So this is a procedure that I guess I'm not gonna expect you to do on the tests. I will give you samples that will already be pre-arranged for you. So minus 85, minus 65. Any more negatives? Then looks like that's it. Okay. So then I have a pair of 20s. So now we look at the positive sample elements. 20s, then there is a 30, also element 40. Oh, there's 27 here also. Almost missed it, that's no good. So 27, then 30, and then 41. Okay. 27, 30. This is annoying part in a way, uh, annoying part, right? This part sometimes takes a while, but little by little, we're getting closer to the end, and that's good news. So 80, then 105, so we're almost done with this. And then it's 186, 140 comes first, then 186, and finally, the largest entry here, which is 325. I think that's all the sample has. Cool. So how many elements are here? Four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 15 sample elements. Okay. So I will recall how we produce the box plot. So the picture of the box was first and the third quartiles that produce it. So I need to find those first and the third quartiles. So let's go for those first and the Q3. So for the Q1, I take 25% of the sample elements. That's another name of it, 25th percentile. Or for the third quarter, that will be 75%. So we'll take 0.25 and multiply by the sample size n, which is 15. So when I do this, I'll get 3.75, 3 and 3 quarters. And when I do the same with multiplying 0.75 and times again, sample size of 15, then this is 11.25. So these two numbers are both decimals. So we move to the next position. No, we don't round them. We just select the elements on the next positions. So these be 
elements number four and elements number 12. So the fourth position is here. Then six, eight, oops, the other thing, six, eight, tens, twelves, fourteens. So twelfths position is here. Twelfths. Okay, twelfths position. So we found these two special numbers. One of them is negative 85, and the other is a positive 105. So those are percentiles that we used to look for. We also used to find median, the middle element of the sample, or 50% half of sample elements. So this is a 7.5. It's another decimal. So same as in the previous steps, I move to position number eight, and then we get some place here where we have our median 24 or 27, 27. So, of course, we can check and see that this is making sense in terms of splitting your sample here into four groups that have three elements in each. So, you can see that if I have the third quartile here with negative five element, actually first quartiles negative 85 and the third quartile was element 105 and my median is in the middle here then looks like these quartiles will split into quarters the elements of sample that remain so there will be three elements in each of four groups so that supports the fact that we are on the right track and that feels better a little bit so now i need those special fences so we can see where those outliers are supposed to be so these fences have special names inner right and the outer fence and same on the other side there's inner fence and also outer fence so i need to now look for the gap in between of those square tiles so since one sits at negative 85 and the other sits at 105 then i need to subtract from 105 subtract number negative 85 so there actually be two minuses and this is how we find this range in between quartiles enter quartile range and we're actually going to have to add not subtract right because two minuses is a plus or you can just put this in a calculator to make sure you do it right so this interquartile range is a key to produce fences but you have to times it by 1.5 and that was the rule that we encountered in that section so i just have to keep that rule in mind i guess and multiply by 1.5 that 190 that i just produced so 185 right i guess this number is the most important for us from now on because we're going to use it to get the 
fences. So we'll start at the right side of the box and go 185 farther to the right once and once again, two times. And then we start on the left side of the box and then we again use the same 185. So we'll be subtracting it. So that's how we do construction. So the key number 185 is going to be heavily utilized here. So I will go from the right side of the box where 105 is, and I'm going to add it with 185. So just do some arithmetic here, and we get a 290, looks like. So this is where I put my fence. So do this once again, 290 and 185. So we are moving to the right. So we're adding them. So it looks like it will be 475. And that's a position for the second special fence. And then start on the other side, on the left side of the box, where negative. 85 is right and then we move again by 185 but since it's in the other direction that we are gonna subtract so negative and negative i actually put together and keep the minus so it'll be something like minus 270 and then once again i subtract that 185 and get the last fence even though probably I don't need it for this particular sample, but just to finish up with this process. So we see that it really follows this procedure of using that 1.5 of interquartile range or number 185 that happened to be the one that I keep on adding. Well, so now it's time to go back to the sample and see what is going on in reality. And with this particular sample that starts on the left side at minus 241, I don't have any outliers on the left side because negative 241 is not farther beyond the fence because minus 270 is farther to the left than minus 241. So I can show it like that. So you put this little thing, like simple start. And the other elements will be when closer to the center of sample. So I'll just go to the other direction to greater side where I saw 325. And then I need to decide if this is going to give me anything or not really. And one can say, Alex, you did miscalculation here. I think it's great that I did because I didn't wake up looks like because I put 185, but that should be 285. I just looked at the number and I said to myself, Alex, how come 190 and 185 is smaller? So it should be 285. It should be 285. So it's a good idea that I noticed. Did you notice it? See, I think it's great that I made that miscalculation because now you know that we need to use a calculator, right? It's a good idea to use that little tool calculator. So this is actually 390, and this is actually going to be 575, right? So it's not hard to fix, but it could give you the wrong results. So 390 is here. And then when I move to the other direction, it will be 285 here, right? And 285 here. So this is going to be like uh, 370, right? 370. It doesn't do anything with the previous, but it still should be fixed, right? 
And then if I add this, I'll get five. 55, looks like this way. So I guess these outer fences are irrelevant anyways, but we wanna be careful when we calculate. So it's great that you also notice this. So now I feel better. So now I can see that 325 is smaller than 390. So that 325 is fine because we are within the range. What does that mean? Well, here's our range. Here's the fence and here's the other inner fence. So there's two inner fences show me where the sample elements should be. And uh, my sample elements are where they should be. They are within fences. So my answer is there are no outliers at all. So the whole sample is good. So if you wanna use its elements to find mean standard deviations, maybe something else, then you can use all of its elements. Don't throw any away because your sample is within the allowed range. So that's what means that sample elements are good. So there are no outliers. And that's actually also important information. So don't get disappointed because not all samples have outliers. I think last time we found one with outliers, but some samples are just fine. So problem here was pretty lengthy, right? Lots of little steps. So the advice is over coming weekend, try to do this exercise again on your own. I will eventually do one more exercise of this type, of course, because this process is something we need to get used to. It is important process for applications. And I would like to make you happy. I would like to show you chapter three where problems will be much, much shorter. Because this is just too long, one can say. And I would totally agree. It's just too many steps, the quartiles, the out, outliers, the fences, all this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to end it for now. So I'm going to just share back the textbook and scroll down to the chapter three, which is starting right here on the next page. And notice that section 3.1 does not have any exercises in it. Well, remember, this is how this book is designed. First sections of every chapter, they're just a overview of what you're gonna see. So I don't wanna uh, look at it at this stage because you will see all that anyways. So, this chapter is called probability. And it's definitely important to know what is that they're talking about. And it turns out that probability is a fraction. So I will create a convenient experiment for you so you can get a better feeling what this is all talking about. So I'm sure you saw this little cube, which is called a die. It has six sides and it has different numbers of dots on each side. So there are sides with one dots, two dots, and etc., all the way up to six of these little dots. So people usually play games with this die, they roll it and see what they got, right? So I'm sure you're already familiar with this. So that's why I wanna select this cube and show all the possibilities that one can get if you roll it, this cube one time. 
and we assume that there are just six choices here so there is no way you can just roll it and uh, it falls in the ocean and you don't know what's on it or other thing that may happen you roll it and it sticks somewhere and it sits on the edge so you don't know what is the top face of this cube so we assume we prepare some nice place like a table so we can roll the cube carefully on that table so nothing happens so we get from one through six outcomes of experiment of rolling this little cube so there are six choices so now i'm gonna calculate some probabilities related to it and the probability that I can count, I can actually calculate various probabilities. Some people say, Alex, I'm so lucky, I always get six. Whenever I roll this little cube, I always get six. So I want to find a chance of this to happen. And out of total number of possibilities that I just listed above, it turns out there is only one that satisfies to the statement to get six. So people say the chance of it is one out of six. And that's how they design this formula. So we produced fraction with a denominator that has a total, total number of choices or that so-called sample space. So entire sample of all of the possibilities. So we put that total in denominator and the numerator, we put the number of possibilities that we're interested in. So it'll be only one because there is only one six that I can see. You can find also various other probabilities. Let's say, what's the probability that someone rolls this cube and gets only one on it. Well, this is going to be the first one, right? And looks like out of six possible choices, again, there is only one that satisfies to this experiment. So it's also one out of six. So there are various questions possible for example, someone can say, well, I need seven. I want to roll and get seven. What's the chances of that? So out of the six possibilities, how many sevens do I have? I don't have any sevens. So it's a zero. It is a zero chance. And this actually tells me that the lowest possible probability is zero. Because you always have a fraction with denominator six in this case. But for a numerator, the lowest I can get is nothing, zero, if there is no chance for that to happen. So I cannot go lower than zero. I cannot get negative probability and that's important to realize how about if uh, someone just to win already has plenty of those dots whatever they rolled it a few times and now they say i need at least one and i already won this game so what will be a chance that if i roll this little cube then out of my six possibilities i will get one or bigger so one is here or bigger which is two three four looks like uh, all six satisfied to such a statement right and this is equal to one so it turns out the largest probability that I can possibly get 
will be taken all of them, all six out of total six. And since this is the largest, I will say my probability cannot possibly exceed number one. So the answers, whenever you have a question about probabilities, are always in between of zeros and ones. No negatives, no 200%, some people say 200% sure. 100% is enough. That's it. 100% means that you get it. And that's it. You don't need to increase it by more percents. So 100 is maximum. I know that in other classes in some economics, your profit may be doubled or even tripled. So you will get 300% profit. It is possible, of course. Or you get negative profit when you get lost, but not in this class. In this class, when they say word probability, the key rule here is that probability must be in between zero and one. And if your answer is not in between, well, then there is something miscalculated and you've done something wrong. So that just should tell you that you need to double check your work and fix it. So probabilities are always between zero and one. That's the first rule for probabilities. So I'd like to start doing some problems in this section just to start today. And of course, we'll continue with this farther and farther. We'll be dealing with this chapter for a while. So exercise number three here asks interesting question. Which one cannot be probabilities? Cannot. So what answer you cannot get for a probability? And I would say negative, right? No negatives. Yes, yes, very good. So negative one is not allowed. So no negative probabilities. Zero and one are fine, but no negatives. What about five thirds? Five over three. That's something like 1.6 or 1 square root two. That's a 1.4. Looks like these two numbers are also no good, just like uh, number two, right? Because we should not be bigger than one. So five thirds, a root of two are out we cannot have them for the answers either. So only four values that left possibly could be probabilities, but definitely not those out of range. How about problem number five? I think that's an interesting exercise that gives you exciting story about the uh, list of eight outcomes that come out when couple has three children. Let me see how those possible outcomes appear if there are two genders for a child, either girl or boy. So for the second child, if first child is a girl, well, second child could also be either girl or boy. So the previous gender doesn't really matter. And same if my first child happened to be boy, then, well, for the second child, still it's either girl or boy. And analogously, I can continue with genders for the other, for the third child. So either girl or boy, no matter what happened before, it's either girl or boy for the genders. So I'll just uh, continue the so-called tree diagram. This is very important and useful diagram when you wanna list all of the possibilities if your sample is pretty small. 
and say, okay, Alex, where are those eight possibilities? It's just a bunch of numbers. Well, if you now start here at the beginning and uh, follow along the branches of this tree, then you end up with a first chance as a three girls, the genders for three children. Or if you now go along the same branch, but then sink down a little bit, so you will get first three girls, but uh, first two girls and the third child, a boy, and etc. So you can get a girl first, then boy, and a girl, and then girl and two boys. And these are the possibilities with the first child being a girl, because now we're going to go with the lower part of a tree with a first child being a boy, and basically go with the same exact possibilities for the other two children. So first is boy, I can also have girl and then a boy. And then if first is boy, then second can also be a boy, but the third could be either girl or a boy. So those are eight possibilities that they're talking about or eight outcomes of our experiment. So when I calculate answers for parts A and so forth, I will have eight in my denominator. So if they say in a part A, find the probability that there's exactly one girl, one girl exactly, they don't tell you if that's a first child or second child or third child, all I know that out of eight possible, I can have girl to be either here, first child, or there, one in the middle, the second child, or girl could be the third child. So it's three out of eight. Very good, so you already see this and that's super. So let us do another part B. Part B says, how about if there are two girls? Please notice that having two girls is equivalent to say, what's the chances to have one boy? Because according to genders, if there are two girls, then one last child should be boy or the middle should be boy or the first should be boy. So it's similar to the previous in a kind of dual way, right? So we can also see there are only three out of total of eight that satisfy to this experiment. So that's great. Great that you see it. I hope you start to like this exercises because they are shorter. Because all you do is you just produce a fraction, something in denominator and something in numerator, and you're done. And that's definitely way less time consuming compared to previous sections. So the last part of this says, what about if all children are girls? So out of eight possibilities, how many have all girls? I can see only one. One out of eight. One eighth is an answer, and that's great. So it looks like you feel comfortable with this. So maybe I will ask you to also find the probability that there are no girls. So for a little quiz for today, please don't hurry. Find what is the probability that there are no girls in the family. And uh, as usual, just uh, put the answer in the chat. So same exact story, same exact setting. And it's all in front of you here, but the answer will be, of course, 
fraction, right? And once you produce this fraction, well, you're done with the quiz. Someone already did it, that's great. So after that, you can relax a little bit. You deserve it. So no girls or yes, equivalent, they're all boys, exactly. So you 